For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. This is Strat News Global. I'm Amitabh Brady, and you're watching our weekly flagship show, The Talking Point. A warm welcome to all our viewers who are watching this on our YouTube channel, and a warm welcome from Brisbane for the first time on uh, the Strat News Global platform to. Ambassador Peter N. Verghese, he's been Australia's uh, former foreign, uh, Secretary of uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. He's currently, of course, the Chancellor of uh, the University of Queensland, but has also uh, been an India hand. We know him here as an ex-High uh, Commissioner and more importantly, also an author of uh, the India Economic Strategy 2035. Ambassador Verghese, uh, absolute pleasure having you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Amitabh. Very, very nice to join you. Pleasure's all ours, Ambassador. Uh, I want to get in straight into your latest piece that uh, we've all read about AUKUS. Now, there's a lot of resonance even in India when it comes uh, to the need to, uh, you know, for building capability and capacity, uh, self-reliance when it comes to uh, fighting one's own battles. Uh, that's part of your argument, right? Well, self-reliance in an alliance context. So the the point I was trying to make wasn't that uh, an alliance isn't crucial for the overall security of Australia, but that we should be basing our thinking on the capacity to defend ourselves without the combat assistance of the United States. That's quite an important qualification. But the alliance itself, of course, is... Uh, a very important part of our um, security, not least through the intelligence it uh, provides us, uh, having a very close Five Eyes intelligence relationship with the US. Uh, the technology it provides us, most recently demonstrated in the uh, commitment to uh, go down the path of examining nuclear submarines, um, and the, you know the, the deterrent calculation that any potential adversary would have to make whether or not the United States would come to the direct assistance of Australia. So they're, they're all very powerful arguments for uh, having a Australian defence and security policy that's anchored in, in an alliance relationship. Right, we're just seeing those uh, pictures that the US State Department had uh, released on 16th of September when AUKUS was announced. Now again, just to uh, flesh out uh, your ideas on AUKUS, you write, you know, it's so that Australia doesn't narrow its options. And like I said, in India also, there's a lot of resonance about this, whether, uh, you know, there should be, we should be so self-reliant on, uh, if we should be so reliant on an outside partner when it comes to, like I said, fighting our own battles. You point out that it's not necessarily the argument that's given by analysts nowadays that, uh, you know, the U.S. is the declining power or unreliable because of what uh, has happened in Afghanistan, but because you can't necessarily always align interests, even though, um, you know, there is alignment of other sorts. Yeah, look, I, I don't think this is a particularly radical proposition. I mean, my, my point was um, you can, and bet between the US and Australia, have a very close alignment of interests in many important respects. But they will never be a complete identity of interests because we are two different countries in different circumstances facing different challenges. Uh, and so, you know, we need to base our calculations on the assumption that um, we have the capacity and the wherewithal to deal with any foreseeable threats to Australia without having to rely on the combat assistance of a third party, whether it's the United States or any other country. I mean, that's, that's I think, the, the key point. In dealing with China, what would your um, policy strategy be in terms of how they have behaved? We've seen it, you know, East China Sea, South China Sea, Senkakus, Galwan, Ladakh, the northern uh, border with Tibet. Uh, economics, trade, Australia facing the brunt of that. Or would you argue that it's uh, because of things like AUKUS that China is behaving like that? Well, I think we're in a completely different phase of the relationship with China. I mean, 
uh, for the last four decades, since the um, opening up of the Chinese economy under Deng Xiaoping, we have essentially been following a policy of uh, engagement. And it's now clear and has been, I think, for several years that hope for the best engagement is not going to be a sufficient basis on which to manage our, our relationships with, uh, with China. And so... Um, I've been arguing that um, a better frame of reference is a policy that uh, rests on both engaging China and constraining China. Uh, the engagement part of that is fairly uh, straightforward. I mean, China is uh, either the largest or the second largest economy, depending on which way you want to measure it. Uh, it is a significant strategic power. Um, it is going to, in my view, continue with an authoritarian political structure for the foreseeable future. And so uh, we have to engage with China, both for bilateral reasons, for regional reasons, and increasingly for global multilateral reasons. But that said, I don't think we can um, completely ignore China's increasingly obvious strategic ambition to be the predominant power in uh, the Indo-Pacific. Um, I see that ambition as an attempt to revive uh, the Middle Kingdom, and the Middle Kingdom was a time, at least in Chinese eyes, where uh, hierarchy was harmony, where China was at the top of the hierarchy, and where China expected other countries in the region, other states in the region, to preemptively concede the paramountcy of uh, China's interests. Well, that's not a uh, that's not a, a, a regime or a, or, a, or a a time that would suit um, countries like Australia, um, not least because of the political character of China. So we do need to uh, find a way to create a new strategic equilibrium, if you like, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, and one which has the capacity for some collective pushback in the event that China were to cross red lines, whether those red lines are uh, coercive behavior or the imposition of uh, economic punishment, uh, or indeed the interference in domestic affairs of, uh, of other countries. So. Uh, this is a project which will take some time. I don't think it will be straightforward. I think it will be um, one step forward, two steps back. But um, I think ultimately that's where uh, we need to be heading. And if we are unable to head in that direction, then I fear we will face a full-blown Cold War 2.0 uh, with the containment of China uh, the decoupling of the global economy and essentially restructuring the economic relationships that we have, many of us, um, prospered from in the last four decades. So I know some people argue we're already in that Cold War 2.0, but I think the great challenge for diplomacy, whether it's from Australia or from other countries, uh, is to stop Not short reaching that. of a second Cold War. Uh, and I believe we can still stop short um, of a second Cold War, but I suspect it will involve these twin strategies of both engaging and constraining China. In terms of uh, constraining, how do you view uh, the Quad and AUKUS? I mean, I know nuclear propelled uh, submarines will probably enter Australian service what almost 20 years from now. But how do you view them uh, as part of the constrainment plus uh, engagement if China wants to? Uh, are they complementary? Do they take away from each other? I, I think they're essentially complementary. Um, I mean, the Quad is quite a significant development in terms of um, putting together uh, a more cohesive and a more coherent and a more credible collective pushback vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, although none of, the four, none of the Quad countries will want to describe it in that language. I mean, it's important diplomatically 
for uh, the Quad not to present itself uh, as um, a um, anti-China grouping, but I think the drivers behind the Quad is that it brings together four countries who each for their own reasons, and the reasons actually differ, so I don't think we should try and find a single explanation for the Quad, but each of those four countries have a particular reason why they don't want to see China as the hegemon of the Indo-Pacific, at least for as long as China retains its current uh, political character. So um, the Quad, in my view, is an evolving structure. Uh, It's had a stop-start history. Uh, I think now China's own behaviour has lent a measure of unity uh, to the quad that it never had before. And I see that only growing uh, in the near to medium term. Um, I think the quad will end up addressing a number of issues. And if you look at the communique from the leaders meeting, uh, the agenda there is very broad, whether it's dealing with infrastructure or vaccines or global challenges. But there will be an element of defence and security cooperation, deepened defence and security cooperation among the four countries. And whether that's uh, exercises, whether it's a larger measure of interoperability, uh, whether it's a a recognition that they each want to bilaterally deepen their security relationships, I think all of those will be a feature. AUKUS, in my view, is a, is, is a, different, uh, is a different beast. Um, I know it's been presented sometimes rather breathlessly as a new security alliance. I don't think it's anything of the sort. Uh, it, is a, it is an important uh, commitment on the part of those three countries, essentially to defence technology cooperation, of which the nuclear submarines will be, if you like, the the first and foremost uh, example. But uh, the announcement of uh, of AUKUS also talked about um, artificial intelligence and um, uh, machine learning and a whole lot of other areas. So I I see AUKUS more as a defence technology cooperation agreement rather than a classical... Um, alliance treaty. I mean, it has nothing in it which uh, uh, resembles a clause about coming to uh, the aid and assistance in the event of an attack. So we need to we need to understand what it is uh, and what it isn't. And um, I mean, I think it is a, a significant leap in technology for Australia. I'm less convinced it's a significant leap in our strategic settings because. Um, Australia has uh, long planned for long-range submarines. And as you know, when we uh, built the Collins-class submarines, which are now reaching the end of their life, they were the the most sort of durable, long-range, non-nuclear submarines uh, in the world. Uh, and the French contract uh, that we entered into and have since abandoned uh, was intended to create, uh, again, the best non-nuclear long-range submarines for Australia. So nuclear technology uh, elevates that to a completely new level. Um, I'm not underestimating the very significant challenges in actually bringing the idea to reality and that's why I think uh, uh, the APCAS announcement uh, envisaged an 18-month period where we would simply mm-hmm. examine the options uh, and the processes. So, you know, for a, for a country to go down this path without a civil nuclear industry, and Australia at the moment rather curiously has a legislative ban on the use of civil nuclear power, Uh, For us to do that um, uh, is going to be a a very big challenge. And as you implied earlier on uh, in our discussion, the timelines here are very long. I mean, uh, on on current estimates, it will be close to 2040 before uh, we have our first nuclear submarine, assuming we proceed with our preference, which is to build them in Australia rather than to, to lease them. Uh, which may bring the timelines forward a little bit. 
you mentioned one of the prongs of uh, the quad and how it's emerged and evolved so fast over the last year or so is uh, because of uh, China's behavior. In terms of unity in dealing with China, I mean, quad, there's talk of quad plus, you have France, which is also an Indo-Pacific power, UK, which is sending its um, aircraft carriers and other um, naval vessels as well. In terms of France and Australia's relationship, now, uh, how does that go? I mean, we've seen US and France kind of um, mending their relations. Would you agree with uh, what, uh, say, Malcolm Turnbull, a former prime minister, has written that, uh, you know, if you double cross people, then there's a price to pay? And how does that affect the unity? That's essentially what I'm asking. Well, I mean, there's no doubt that uh, there's some uh, deeply bruised feelings on the part of France, and uh, France uh, has felt that um, uh, Australia has uh, treated it badly in terms of not giving it advance notice about the um, AUKUS announcement. Um, I think it will take some time before... Uh, those wounds are healed, although, you know, just uh, in the last day or so, uh, the French have announced that they are returning their ambassador to Canberra, and that's a very positive step forward. But um, if you step back a little bit, um, I don't think it fundamentally shifts Australia's view of France as a country which has a contribution to make to the broader uh, strategic outlook in the Indo-Pacific because France is a country which has territory in the Indo-Pacific. It has some two million citizens in the Indo-Pacific. Um, it sees itself as a as a player, uh, and we we recognise that. Um, I, I think inevitably the heavy lifting, if I could put it that way, of uh, dealing with the security challenges in the Indo-Pacific will fall more to countries in the region um, rather than to uh, the countries of Europe. So while um, I think the Europeans themselves are beginning to understand that the strategic implications of China's current trajectory and policy, and, you know, that could well change, um, require them to have more than an economic view of China. And so I, I think uh, we will see a, a closer collaboration between the EU, between, between Europe, UK now outside of the EU, but I think they'll be part of that clutch of countries in Europe um, who will be part of this broader process of creating a new strategic equilibrium, but they won't be first-tier players, in my view. The first-tier players will be the countries of the region, um, with the Quad being quite an important part of that. Uh, talking about first-tier players, how do you see the evolution of India-Australia relations? And uh, if I can begin with, say, defence ties, how we've moved on uh, in terms of uh, evolving our comprehensive strategic partnership? Yeah. Well, I, I think um, the Australia-India relationship has got um, a very bright future because um, it is increasingly based on hard interests. Um, if, you, if you look at the relationship at the moment, uh, the strategic relationship, uh, the geopolitical relationship uh, has grown remarkably quickly. Um, when I um, left Delhi in the end of 2012, uh, my expectation was that the economic relationship would grow at a much faster clip than the strategic relationship. And it's, uh, it's a measure of how much the world has changed and how much the region has changed and how much China's policy settings have changed uh, that uh, what we've seen is actually the opposite, that the security and strategic relationship between Australia and India has grown much more quickly than the uh, than the economic relationship. So I think we now have um, uh, a significant and indeed growing measure of strategic congruence between Australia and India. And if you add to that um, the longer term prospects of the economic relationship, and in my uh, report to the then Prime Minister on an India economic strategy, I did 
say that there was no other single market in the world that had as much growth opportunities for Australia as India. Now, admittedly, that was coming off a relatively low base, but that remains my view uh, because what's driving uh, the Indian economy are some deeply structural factors which I think will, um, you know, make it clearer why those growth opportunities are, are there. So uh, on both the economic and the strategic side, I'm, I'm a long-term optimist about this relationship. And there is now a very important third element to our relationship, which is the people-to-people -people connection. And this has been, you know, something which has only really developed in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, the very rapid growth of an Indian, Indian diaspora in Australia, now over 700,000 strong, I think they will be a very important bridge between the two countries. I think they'll be not just cultural navigators for the relationship, but also business navigators for the relationship. So they'll give the relationship texture. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you add all of those strands together, I think we are looking at a very substantial relationship. And uh, I made the point that India needed to be brought into the first tier of Australia's um, relationships from a strategic and economic point of view. And I think we're, we're well on our way there. Economically, maybe a bit slower, but we'll get there. But just taking up from that last point, you mentioned uh, your other hat, which is the author of uh, the uh, India Australia Economic Strategy 2035. We also spoke, I think, maybe three weeks back to Ambassador Anil Vadva, who is the author of the CII Australia Economic Strategy 2020. The movement that we've seen now, both in terms of statements and uh, meetings that have taken place, uh, which are talking about the possibility of an early harvest or interim, however you want to term it, by December or Christmas this year and then by 2022, end of uh, 2022, uh, full-fledged FDA or Zika. Uh, how do you see that progressing? What are the hiccups? Well, I, I think I think the resumption of the negotiations on Zika is, uh, is a welcome step. Um, I think, uh, you know, both sides uh, want to try and make this work. Um, I'm a little bit more at the sceptical end of whether a so-called early harvest is the best thing to aim for, uh, not because I want the process sort of prolonged and held back, but um, I do worry that um, one of the prices you can pay for an early harvest is that it makes a later harvest actually more complicated. But, you know, um, that said, uh, I noticed in the um, joint statement that uh, the Indian Commerce Minister and our Trade Minister uh, released, they see this interim agreement as being uh, pretty comprehensive in terms of its coverage across goods and services and, uh, and investment. And so um, if we can get to a comprehensive agreement, <clears throat> even if it's not as comprehensive as, uh, as we might like by uh, the end of uh, the end of next year, that would be a very important step forward. But Amitab, it's also important to bear in mind that our economic relationship does not live or die by the conclusion of a free trade agreement or a seeker. <clears throat> there are many things that we can and indeed should be doing, which are not at all dependent on a seeker. Um, so. Sure, an FTA uh, is a good thing. An FTA uh, increases the scope for economic cooperation. An FTA might hasten uh, the expansion of our relationship. But um, this is going to be a substantial relationship with or without uh, an FTA. And uh, we ought not to sort of make the FTA the sort of leitmotif of our relationship or indeed find ourselves in the position where we consider the relationship a failure if we don't conclude an FTA. I mean, um, you know, uh, in, in many of our other FTA negotiations, the conclusion of an FTA has arrived well after those economic relationships have been very well anchored and, and, and substantial, whether we're talking about Korea 
or the United States or Japan or indeed China, the FDA we did for China. True. Uh, talking about economics, how, what is your view on uh, CPTPP and the developments there? China giving in its papers they, on the day August was announced, or the next day, Taiwan also there. Uh, how do you see those developments in, in terms of current geoeconomic uh, yeah. situations? Well, I mean, the, the, the TPP Mark II, which is, I prefer to use that language rather than the rather convoluted, yeah. <laughs> comprehensive and progressive. TPP. Um, look, it, it is uh, a very important agreement for a number of reasons. Firstly, it sets benchmarks which are leading edge. I mean, they are, they are best practice in terms of trade negotiations. Secondly, um, I think the, the TPP offers an opportunity to enter into uh, an agreement which potentially can include both China and the United States. And uh, I think it's a positive sign that China has indicated an interest in joining uh, the TPP. Um, it's not going to be a straightforward exercise and uh, certainly from a narrowly Australia-China perspective, we'd want to uh, clear some of the obstacles to communication between our two governments before we get too far uh, down that path. But, you know, ultimately the concept of uh, an arrangement which includes the countries of the region as well as China and the United States built around concepts of trade liberalisation and facilitating investment uh, is a good thing. Um, and indeed, uh, if we are to have a chance at stopping short of a second Cold War, uh, I think it could be quite a useful instrument. Um, but having said that, uh, you know, I think uh, it's not going to be an easy set of obligations for China to take on, given the nature of its economy, and indeed given the way in which the Chinese economy seems at the moment to be moving more away from a market economy and towards more of a state-controlled economy, um, that will complicate, I think, its uh, ability to abide by uh, TPP obligations. I think it was a huge mistake for the United States not to sign on to TPP. The Obama administration were in many ways the author of the TPP and uh, unfortunately became a victim of US domestic politics, but it was, it was a missed opportunity. And uh, what is very obvious now is that uh, the US pivot to Asia uh, does not have a substantial economic element to it. Um, and given that this is where the center of gravity of uh, the global economy is going to be to have a pivot without uh, an economic dimension to it, I think is a huge gap in US policy. So the TPP, again, offers an opportunity to try and at least fill that. As Chancellor of the University of Queensland, uh, about your institution and how we have you know, read so much about uh, institutions in educational and other institutions in Australia under the influence of uh, China, how are you dealing with that? Well, these are, these are difficult times for uh, international students from anywhere uh, in Australian universities because our borders have been closed um, since the beginning of last year um, and we still don't have any certainty about when uh, the borders will, uh, will reopen. Um, well before COVID, I think Australian universities were uh, acutely aware of the risks of an over-dependence on the Chinese market and the importance of diversifying uh, the sources of uh, international students coming into our campuses. Um, and we've all been in our own way trying to um, make that diversification uh, a reality. Uh, but the, the sort of Counter-reality has been that the demand from China has been so strong uh, that uh, it, would, it was difficult for universities to choose to turn that tap down when the demand was there and the capacity to respond to the demand by Australian universities was also there. 
So I think we're moving into now uh, a different phase. Uh, I think the operating models of Australian universities uh, will need to change uh, in the light of COVID. Um, I think there will still be a very important role for international students. Um, I think unless China, for broader bilateral reasons, chooses to discourage its students, my own expectation is that uh, when our borders do reopen, there'll still be strong demand from China uh, unless they state intervention to curtail that. Um, India is a very important um, education partner for Australia. In my report, I said that it was, it was the flagship sector for building our economic relationship. I mean, if you look at the gap between what India needs and what it can domestically provide by way of higher education, um, it's a very large gap uh, in the upskilling of 400 million Indians, whether it's across vocational or higher education, um, is going to um, create uh, opportunities, partnership opportunities. I'm not just talking about Indian students coming to sure. Australia. Um, so I, I see that um, I see that growing. Uh, I'm very keen uh, that we position ourselves in India as a quality education destination and not merely a pathway to migration. Um, there's no, uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, uh, prospective Indian students looking at studying in Australia with an eye to migration. Um, for as long as we're a country of high migration, uh, we want good migrants and uh, Indians with an Australian education uh, will make very good migrants. But uh, I think it's also important that we are seen in the Indian market as the quality destination that we are. I mean, after all, Australia has six of our 39 universities in the top 100 globally. There are not many countries that can claim to have such a high proportion in the in the top 100. Um, and I think we need a much stronger research collaboration agenda between our two countries uh, working on issues that uh, are national priorities for India, but also of interest to Australia. And in the case of the University of Queensland, my own university, we have now set up a joint research academy with Delhi IIT with the intention of producing two to 300 joint PhD researchers uh, when it reaches its peak. So that's the you know, that's the sort of new direction in which I think it's important for our education relationship to go. And I still think that there is a lot more we can do on the vocational side um, to work with India to um, upskill uh, from a vocational and training point of view uh, the people that it will need because it's going to be so fundamental to the future of India that it has the skills that it needs to run a large modern economy. Absolutely. And again, talking about the University of uh, Queensland Chancellor, we've seen this so-called hostage diplomacy that uh, China was involved with the two Michaels. Now, considering the situation where there's so much of coercion that uh, China is uh, you know, carrying out against Australia on different dimensions. And I do know the University of uh, Queensland has a lot of you know, uh, back and forth in, with China in terms of uh, educational research and other purposes. Is there any risk management uh, that is being looked at here? Because you really don't know what uh, could happen in the future. Uh, indeed, there is. In fact, there's a lot of work that's been done uh, by the universities and the government working collaboratively mm. to uh, ensure that um, Australia's research partnerships, and this is not focused exclusively on China, but to ensure sure. that Australia's research partnerships uh, are not in any way uh, compromising our national security. So um, we have, uh, as you as you say, uh, a, a number of research collaborations with uh, with China, uh, as do many other Australian group of eight universities and indeed other universities. Um, but we have now um, agreed on guidelines uh, on how we will manage those research relationships. Uh, including how we would manage potential conflict of interests, ensuring that we have 
clear lines of sight of what uh, research is being done uh, and that we have the mechanisms in place to enable warning bells to ring uh, if they if they need to be ringing. Because as you know, um, uh, researchers tend to get very um, uh, focused on their own field and sometimes the bigger picture may not be so evident to them. So I think... Um, I think both the university sector and the government now is comfortable that we have um, a, a workable framework for ensuring that necessary research collaboration, because research is a global enterprise and um, you gain knowledge by sharing knowledge, necessary research collaboration can continue, but that it continues in a way which doesn't in any way put national security at risk. Chancellor Vergis, uh, Foreign Secretary Vergis, Ambassador Vergis, thank you for putting on all those hats and giving us this absolutely uh, fascinating and uh, comprehensive chat. My pleasure, Amitav. All the best. And of course, it's just you and me and maybe some of your staff and uh, some of our staff who know the four part that I almost caused with the timing for this interview. But thank you again <laughs> for bearing with us and uh, uh, giving us this interview. My pleasure. My pleasure. Just a reminder to all our viewers that uh, to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow our social media handles on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram for the latest news and analysis from an Indian perspective. This is Talking Point on Strat News Global. I'm Amitabh Brady.